Welcome to the Athlete Hustle Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Chin. With me today is co-host of the High Performance Podcast, Angus, Angus Bradley. Sorry. And so Angus is also a trainer. Um, he's been training people for quite a while now. And uh, Angus and I used to work together for a while. And um, I knew at one point that Angus was going to be a really good trainer because he did something that we all should do, but none of us ever do do is actually come up and ask for advice or help. And at that point I'd realized that this kid's going to do good because you know, it's just, I'm so like myself personally, I'm so meatheaded that I'll just be like, I know I should ask someone for this help, but instead I'm going to try and figure out how to do it myself. And what that does is it takes a lot of time to learn those lessons. Whereas Angus just went up and plucked it out of her head, which is what we, we want to give him the advice. We just don't want to ask people for advice. And that kind of moves people along a lot quicker. And that's one of the great things about Angus. So Angus is really, really intelligent. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion. So welcome to the show, Angus. You're too kind. No, but see, I think you got the wrong idea about why, because I asked everyone the questions, but it's honestly just more of a test to see if I could have a reasonable conversation with them. Because honestly, because we, we were in the same gym environment, obviously, and there were certain people where you would, you know, you'd ask them a question and you just, it wouldn't be a discussion. You would just get an answer, usually a crap answer. Whereas like, yeah. I felt like you were one of the people where I could have a discussion with and you would always treat me like an equal. Even when I wasn't a trainer, you would talk to me like I had my own ideas about training, which I always appreciated. And yeah, it was just, it was a cool place to start out, even if things did get a little weird at times with people like Max and that. I'm sure they're all chilled out now. Yeah, I think they have chilled out. You know, the funny thing about Max is that to this day, no matter all the trash that you talk to him about, uh, you know, like the fact that you guys had all that beef, if you were to approach him today and say, hey, Max. Are we good? You reckon? Yeah, fine. Honestly, it'd be fine. I, I, it's just because it, it got so hectic at the end out of nowhere. I thought like, I, cause I'm cool with it. Cause I talk about it. Like it's a funny story. And like, if anything, if he's heard me talk about it, that would probably make him less cool with it these days. Yeah. But I do joke about it quite a bit, <laughs> but I just, no, I hope it's all good. I don't have any bad blood. He was the one that's just like, bananas is bad for weight loss. Let's, <laughs> let's meet me out the front. Let's throw down. And I was just like, man, there's, there's got to be another way. That was bananas. That morning, he was calling up my dad and my dad's like, bro, I sell toilet paper to the gym. I'm not the banana guy. And then my dad's calling me going, what did you say to Max? And I was like, I just said you could eat bananas and lose weight. He's like, why are you always start shit, man? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Max, if you're listening, I love you, mate. You gave me my first, my first gig as a PT. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You... Clients back in the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you put your vibe in and then bananas came along and that was the end of you guys. And that was the end of it. And, <clears throat> but yeah, and then, I don't know, been training people for about five years now. It was kind of a good thing because I think that sort of opened the door to go up to Sydney with Oscar and sort of, you know, as much as it was good hanging out with the boys all day, eventually you got to spread your wings. But then I, f I find myself doing the same thing because I ended up in such a social workplace up in the city. It was exactly the same as Wollongong. It was like excellent gym to work at. Right, just like right. way too social of a work environment. So I'm kind of glad that Corona's kind of disbanded my gym or at least the group of trainers that were there. So now we can actually, you know, focus, focus on getting some oh, work right. done. Yeah, I, I find that to be hard too. These days, you can get caught up and you're just exchanging ideas all day. But it's like well, at some point you've got you to go implement. Yeah, 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 100%. And, and, you know, your clients will appreciate you kind of paying a little bit more focus on too which is kind of yeah you know that's that's another thing you know i remember like i almost got uh kicked out of the gym at one point um uh, not for anything serious i just max walked up to me i was about i had three sessions left for the night so you know it started a while ago and uh, i got told to move a piece of equipment from one side of the gym to the other side of the gym and i didn't and <laughs> then i go to, i get a message at six o'clock in the morning and max is like friday's the last day mate you're out <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I just, um, I, I'm, I send that message to, to Grant, who's another one of the owners of the gym. And Grant's like, oh, mate, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll sort it out. And that's what's so hard to explain to people about working in the fitness industry. It's like, that's the kind of shit you deal with. Like someone will have your business in the palm of their <laughs> hand. And like, he's like, you can't come into the gym tomorrow. And you've just been, you had a civil agreement with this bloke. And like, 
you can't go to fair work or anything like that. You're just kind of on your own or you message yeah. the other owner of the gym. And then it's like, is this my boss or like are my parents fighting? Like, and I'm calling yeah. in the middle. This could be, it could be a reality TV show. People don't really realize. Um, yeah. So virtually today, guys, the, the, uh, the, this podcast is just about a few of, um, Angus's posts that I've been, uh, I've been admiring. I, I really like his stuff. So if you follow him on the gram, if you don't, I'll put in the show notes at the bottom, um, all these details so you can follow him. And, um, so basically what happens is Angus isn't afraid to call out the industry for the, for the crap that goes on in the industry. And I really like that about him. So he will just like, you know, there's all sorts of crap that goes on and he's always the first one to step up and say, what the hell are you doing? This is bull crap. And so basically what he does on his, on his Instagram is he puts up a post almost every day, I think. And he um, basically just calls people out, not people, but you know, things that people do about. And then it, um, and then it just goes on from there. And so today I've picked out about five or six or seven of his best stuff and we're going to just talk about it and if we get to them all that'd be great if we don't then we might just have to do a follow-up interview later on no so, worries the first one is belly breathing is trash could you explain yes. that now this trigger warning for everyone because this might um all right, firstly um i think we're going to use explicit language we don't you know usually have you got, have you got the thing the e no, I don't have the E. I can get it. I, I can, like, whenever I post it, it just asks if, I wanna, if I'm going to have explicit language. Uh, so that's fine. I'll just click. I back. can try to not swear as well. Have we swear? Uh, it's yet? fine. Just you be you, man. And I'll tell you what, it's just that the more explicit it gets, the more entertaining it gets, to be honest. Okay, it's okay. just that our show typically isn't, just because we're talking about specifically exercise or programming and, or something like that, there's kids. no room for swearing anyways. So it just... You know, this just happens if we the type of podcast where this is probably all going to come out. So no, 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 no. It's all right. We don't have to swear. No, we'll no, no, see, you we'll do, see you how know. it goes. We'll see how it goes. No, no, because no, I want to present in future. And I, I think people get hesitant about inviting you to present when they're like, is this guy just going to yell and swear at everyone? Like, so I want to try to change how I come across. Like, because that's the thing. I think a lot of my posts on Instagram, they come across angry. Except it's really just me. Disappointment. It's a journal to my younger self as a coach. 90% of the time. 10% of the time. It's just something I've seen that day that annoyed me. Anyway, so belly breathing. Yeah. Let's get into it. I think that you, you always hear this thing. People breathe too much up in their chest. People breathe. It's, it's, all, it's all up up in here, the breathing. So you need to get it lower. You need to belly breathe. That's the way to relax. That's the way to engage your deep abdominal muscles. You, you always hear about, you know, it improves the function of the diaphragm and things like that. But I think belly breathing is just sort of one extreme to another. Um, and this is sort of stuff that I've all learned through people like David Gray, Zach Couples, a bit of Pat Davidson and things like that, because I think people just aren't correctly assessing how people are breathing. Um, because I don't think we actually see a lot of chest breathers out there in the wild. I think a lot of what we see, you see either belly breathers where it's all belly expansion or for a lot of people, they just sort of use their neck to breathe. It's like very active around the traps and like the neck and the scaly muscles and all those things. So there's space in between that. I don't want to see just expansion in the belly because that's bad. I also don't want to see just that neck area and just that sort of shrugging look when people inhale. What we actually want to see is chest breathing, but it has to be expansion. Say if I was... Are you going to release this on video? Most people listen. Yeah, right? man. We're going, it's going to be on podcast plus it's going to be on YouTube if you want. So if you imagine that you're standing beside someone and you're looking into their ear hole, that's the view of them that you have. You, you want to see their chest wall expanding. So their sternum moving forward when they inhale. But you also want to see the back of their rib cage expanding just as much. And then you want to see the sides of them expanding as well. When you see just the belly expanding and breathing, that's just everything following the path of least resistance. It's a sign that your rib cage is really stiff. And whenever you're trying to inhale, your lungs actually aren't able to expand that much. And that's just all your guts coming through your abdominal wall. And I think 
when that happens, it just starts this snowballing effect of every time you try to inhale further, you just drive yourself into this extended posture. So arched, like rib cage flaring, no control of the sagittal plane, compressed lower back and really expanded abs. And I know that there are people who can think to try and belly breathe and they don't necessarily get this really exaggerated extended posture. But honestly, I think that's what you get most of the time, right? And I, I think as well, the whole idea of like, like deeper breathing is a bit of a misnomer. Like it sounds good, right? Get more air in, get more oxygen into the bloodstream. But like what I would rather see is a more efficient breath. Because if you're trying to do deep breathing all the time, it's just like... It's like sprinting everywhere. It's like, oh, you go, go faster. That sounds like a good thing. It's like, well, you don't want to run everywhere. Like, what, why are you trying to get so much air in in the first place? How much air do you need? Maybe if you could get air into the bottom part of your lungs that has better blood flow, you'd actually be able to oxygenate your blood without taking in as much air. Um, so, you know, maybe we're, what we're looking for is a more efficient breath over a big breath. Now, I'll throw a caveat because I have been thinking about this one because obviously all the screaming and crying yoga teachers in my DMs, I was, I was sort of trying to find some positives. And honestly, I think the whole idea of belly breathing, it would just be for variability. Like say you haven't expanded through your belly belly wall say you've just been breathing really well doing some belly breathing intentionally is probably like i don't know a good way to stretch out your abs maybe if they're getting a little bit tight or something like that i've also seen people i think there's like a wim hof technique where they actually do belly breathing to elevate the heart rate and and get you it really excited so i actually think that if, if you're too relaxed and you're trying to get aroused and you're trying to wake up, I think that's where belly breathing might actually have some utility because I think belly breathing is a stress on our system because it's compressive in nature, at least mm. posteriorly compressive. Um, I talked for a long time there. I'm sorry. But no, yeah, man. That, that's my general take on it. No, that's good, man. The um, <clears throat> I've also seen some stuff where guys have been... Um, you know, breathing into balloons and that kind mm. of thing. I, I'm not actually sure what that was all about, but uh, it's something to do with improving sports performance. So, so that's that. just to, when you make certain shapes with your mouth, it's just to control airflow. There's no real, the balloon doesn't have to be there. It's just something to focus on. This is, sorry, I don't know. That this is not what they say in the courses because that's like a postural restoration institute thing and all the stuff that i've studied has been adjacent to postural restoration institute so i don't actually know their justification for the balloon but like sometimes when you give someone like a breathing drill they're so in their own head if you just stick a balloon in their mouth it's like just focus on that like i'm gonna do some things to you you're gonna do some things but just think about the balloon and like you know what i mean i i I, I don't really use balloons that often, but it can just be sort of good for controlling the shapes that they make and controlling that you can really get them to focus on exhalation. You're like, rather than saying exhale, you just like make the balloon bigger. So it's just a bit more um, implicit cueing or like constraints based training. 100%. Yeah, I guess that's all it is. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's again, you know, for most people, that's just like your maybe one percenters that, that, you know, if you've got the other like 80% down pat and you're just looking for like little 1% gains, that's probably where that's going to come from. Yeah. yeah. I think the thing with belly breathing and why people are so easily misled is because people don't really understand what a breath should look like in the first place from a biomechanical perspective. Like I think it's when people talk about the diaphragm, I don't even know what they're visualizing in their head. Cause I think a lot of people never actually like look at the shape of it or anything like that, because that's another thing where, I think people dip back into the belly breathing thing, trying to increase diaphragm function. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, if you close that rib cage off, that's what actually allows you to take that diaphragm through that full range of motion. Cause when you are like have those rib, ribs flared, that stretches out the diaphragm. So it's always like a little bit eccentrically oriented. So it's like, you don't even really get any more um, diaphragm function or anything like that through the belly breathing. It's just like, like yeah. So yeah. just, just so people actually are clear on what we do want to see, if you think of a rib cage, and if you can't visualize a picture of a rib cage, just Google one. They're all pretty straightforward. But um, what, so what we want to see when you inhale, you've got like your sternum here and you want, you want to see that 
expand outwards. And then the other thing you want to see expand is um, you've got two types of ribs. You have false ribs and then sternal ribs. So sternal ribs obviously connect at the sternum, but then you've got the false ribs down lower that are floating. So then you want to see them move out to the sides. So they're the two main things. It's called the pump handle is the sternum and then the bucket handle. If you get all those things moving, um, generally speaking, you, your breathing will be pretty decent and you won't be too much of a neck chest breather. You won't be too much of a belly breather. That's like a, a real nice general breathing strategy. And if you use that as your default, you'll usually be sweet. Whether you try to relax, brace, go for a run, anything. That's sort of just good general breathing technique. 100%. So we virtually to wrap that up. We're all told that we should be breathing for our belly, especially if you go to yoga or something like that. They're kind yeah. of, you know, talking that up quite a lot. But in reality, it, it's not so much the case. An all well-rounded kind of breath is good. If we're trying to get stimulated for sport, probably more of a belly breath would be better. Because way to get fired up, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, it, it may be because it, it could oxygenate oxygenate the blood a lot more. In which case, it would be better for your sports performance. Yeah, and also if you belly breathe and you feel good. Fuck me, right? You don't keep doing it. Like, <laughs> if, if it's if it's everything, everything you've ever looked for, and you feel like it's just ticking those boxes, keep doing it. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. I just yeah. if you belly breathe and like me, and you felt like you didn't get anything out of it, there's that there's some stuff sort of to go off. Yeah, and I gotta agree with that because I I was stuck there for a while, just thinking, okay, now I've got to belly breathe, got to belly breathe. But it's like it becomes such a conscious kind of thing that's it's not innate. I think it's kind of like. I don't know. Like well, for me, at least and that's, like that's a stress breathe. in itself. You're like, yeah, I like to breathe all around it anyways. And, 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 like, um, I think you can kind of see on the street, if you're walking down the road and you see people with their shoulders just naturally sitting up all the time, they're probably more likely to be your neck breathers. Uh, yeah. Or, you, know, you, you know, and, and so you can see that, but if you, if you got kind of like you, your shoulders are kind of like sat, you know, normal, I, I would say normal, um, or, you know, sort of not, not, too depressed like nothing that stands out just kind of neutral yeah Yeah, i mean you're probably you're breathing probably not too badly at least dude so much stuff is just like do they look fine like it's such a weird thing like sometimes if you just look at something like that it looks a bit weird then it will be weird like it's crazy how much we're used to seeing certain things like um you can just pick up when someone's breathing funny or walking funny. It just always stands out. It's like when they yeah. make robots, you know what I mean? Like the robot faces, it's like, it's human, but you know that there's something different about it. Yeah, hundred percent. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is foam rollers are the Bosa ball of this century, this decade. <laughs> That wasn't even, I think a lot of people took that as like, oh, BOSU balls and foam rollers are bad. I just think it's like, it's just this thing that we originally, what its original intended purpose was versus what we actually find use for it now as uh, are completely separate things. Right. See, I, I've given my fair share of crap to BOSU balls. Although in saying that, I'm, I'm usually fairly open-minded about virtually anything. Any, even exercises, people think, oh, no, what are you doing? You can't do that or you're going to hurt yourself. I yeah. still keep an open mind to the idea that it's just a movement. Your body's very adaptable and I'll adapt yeah. to that and get stronger for that movement, you know, eventually anyways or whatever. So like, I'm not, I, I, I'm pretty open-minded to, to most anything. Do you follow yeah. David Weck, the guy who invented the BOSU ball? No. So it's weird. Like a lot of people use it for balance and like single leg work and things like that but from what i can tell that's just not what it was meant to be used for at all it's sort of just meant to be used as like a different kind of ground surface so most of the things i've seen him do on a a bilateral and he's also standing or in his trainers or his athletes are standing on the curved surface a lot more which definitely like yields to to your shape a lot more which is like really interesting but like i also just use a bosu ball for a headrest a lot like if i have my client laying on the ground and, and things like that. Or uh, sometimes it can be in the dome shape can be handy if you want to do some crunches over it or something like that. But, and then I sort of, I guess where I saw the similarities in the foam roller is initially, you know, everyone was like, Oh, I've got to roll out my IT band, got to release all the tissues and things like that, or got to break up all the adhesions and scar tissue. Whereas now it's sort of, I just get people to squeeze them between their thighs to get some adductors Again, using it as sort of like a headrest and things like that. I also, they're pretty much just ornamental to me these days. Yeah. And do you think like the, um, 
So I, I, I found that actually quite interesting. And yeah, it makes sense that he would, he designed it. So you'd use the soft part. And I think we're just like, I think we just all derped out and we're like, Oh, I wonder what happens if you turn this thing upside down. And yeah, then- exactly. Yeah. That's what happens in the fitness industry. You create something for people. And look, I'm not even saying David Weck has all the answers. I think the guy's bananas, but like, it's just interesting how once you release something to the world, the world's going to turn it into whatever it wants to. Yeah. And then, so, um, and then, then what's your take on foam rollers generally anyways? How do you, how do you kind of like, do you think that utility is, is as great as we think it is or as people generally no. think it is? Like as in, I love foam rollers and I recently post Corona <clears throat> or post shutdown for Corona when my gym reopened, we couldn't have foam rollers because apparently they spread Corona or something. Um, and they're one of the things that I've really missed because I use them heaps just as like, a prop and as a tool to like put someone in a certain position but as far as the actual rolling or massaging aspect of it i don't use them for that at all um and i don't think anyone needs to so i drank the foam rolling kool-aid so hard when it first came out and i think it can feel good right but like heaps of things feel good like so it's just like there's no unique benefit to foam rolling. If that's your particular fetish and you've, you've got an emotional connection with it and it's just part of your routine and you love it, don't stop doing it. But if you feel like you're spending too much time in the gym, it's taking a bit more time to warm up than what you'd like, I think just skip it. Get into something that actually increases your temperature and looks like the thing that you're trying to do. And I think that that will have all the benefits and more that you'll get from foam rolling. Um, where foam rolling can be helpful But again, this is sort of anything could be substituted in here. And Carl Dobbs was the one that alerted me to this. A lot of people are very anxious when they come into a gym. Um, I think as trainers, we take for granted how comfortable we are in the gym sometimes. So if you come in and you grab your foam roller because it's safe, it's routine, you get to roll out your muscles while you sort of look around the gym and you see who's there and you gradually become more familiar with your circumstances. Just so, you know, you're going into a stressful place You don't want your first activity in there to be too stressful. So foam rolling, it it just is this easy thing for people to manage as they sort of get themselves more comfortable with the gym environment for that day. So can foam rolling be good? Anything can be good. Is foam rolling always good? Does it help? I don't think so. Mm. Yeah, I've got this view of it right now where it seems to be that foam rolling is just more of... It's a good way to kind of like... If you've got some sort of acute... Uh, tightness that otherwise wouldn't normally be there and it's there because of for yeah. some reason and then you just loosen it off and then it allows you to do your session that day that's great yes but it, yeah, it it's something good for the acute chronic. stuff but it's, it's more just the every session yeah 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 it shouldn't be something chronic like if you've got something chronic it shouldn't be something that you go to all the time because it's not fixing the issue the issue is only going to get worse or just stay the same so you know like angus was saying you know something like a activation like an activation or or a movement which is similar to the movement that you're going to be doing so if you're going to be doing squats uh, as your first exercise then maybe you should be squatting or something like that for your warm-up because you can't get any any more specific than that and you can't get a better warm-up than that it's just you just can't yes yeah Mm. it just feels like it's never the best option yeah yeah it's not and and like you know it's i think we use it like yeah i think we just use we we put too much stock in it where it's i think it's best uh best use is only like maybe five percent of the time and you got like a little issue or something you know like that's the best time to jump on it because it may actually alleviate it and, and then in which case uh, it might never come back and then you just go on about your day. Um, but yeah, it shouldn't be something for something chronic. Like where we use it. It's probably good. F- yeah. It's probably good for people who have really bad body awareness. Cause it's like, what does my IT band feel like today? They won't know until they drag a foam roller across it. And they're like, Oh, it actually feels bad. I didn't know that. And like, cause you know, I feel like as trainers, again, that's something we probably take for granted. Probably always, got a pretty good idea of, you know, sensing ourselves, sensing our level of preparedness in our body. So I think for people who are just extremely disconnected from themselves, like it's probably something. True. That. That's a good point too, because that, you know, but in saying that, I, I also got this feeling like that, you know, your body, if you've never been on a firm roll before, 
yeah, virtually everything sucks when, when you touch it, especially the first, like, oh yeah, the first session. Everyone should do one really good foam roll in their life because that is some. Be- there's some benefit to that. I felt amazing <laughs> the first time I used a foam roller. Yeah, yeah, but you got to hear the spiel beforehand. Yeah, you got to hear the spiel because like if, if they give you the shtick about it, and then you're like, oh my god, this is gonna be life changing. Oh, you know what I was talking about the other day? Um, is do you remember? A, is this about wine? No, 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 no. Uh, this is. Um, what? Do you remember power bands? Which ones? Like, are you talking about like conjugate, like doing West Side? Nope, like, no, no, are you no. talk- the ones oh, are you talking about the magnetic yeah. bracelet? That do you would, remember yes. Those? Yeah, no, I had heaps of those. Oh. Max, Max sold them, remember? Yeah, I, 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 off Max. I did say, remember. I was, um, uh, I was having this discussion the other day because it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, you got to hear the shtick. You, you got to be given, given the full rundown about how this thing's going to be, you know, you know, it's going to increase your performance. And it's like, oh, wow. And then, you know, because I remember being in the gym and one of the guys had one. Can we, sorry, just for listeners, because I feel like, you, especially your 16 year old athletes, that were, they weren't even oh, true. around so to this shit. His, the, the power band is virtually just, uh, it's like one of those. Um, it's a rubber bracelet. It's like it's a like bracelet. The live strong charity bracelets. Yeah, it's like a charity bracelet that says like, you know, good things on it or whatever. It, it looks something like that, but it's got like this um, reflective uh, logo on it, which which was just like... Was that meant to be a magnet? Yeah, I, I, but I don't think there was any magnets in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and these things costed around 60 bucks. And um, you put one on and uh, the idea is it's supposed to improve your balance, improve your performance and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, back in the day, all the football players had one on. If you look back into 2009 or 10 and... Um, no, was it, it was, I, I, I think it was earlier than that. I please, started tell, please tell me it was longer ago. Oh, no, I think it was that, bro. I, I, That's well, embarrassing. You, know, you can Google this. <laughs> I'm just saying that. But anyways, um, the the test was is that you'd put one of these, uh, you, you wouldn't have a band on and you stand up on one leg, you'd have your hand out in front of you and then someone would come along and push your arm down and you'd fall off balance right away. And then you put this band on and you do the same test, someone pushes your arm down, but it's harder. And then just immovable arm. object. You are an immovable object and it freaking worked, which is insane. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, um, I did the same test for my clients because they'd never heard about it. And I, I did it and I did it without the band. And the second time was actually harder to push me over because, you know, I, my body probably was like, oh, shit, okay, we need a sort of preparedness. Up. Yeah. It's, it's got a certain level of preparedness. And it's like, okay, that's what it was. And why didn't we decide to check this back in the day? You know, anyway, so um, one of the guys in the gym, Max, he would, um, he went out and bought a whole bunch. Of, he told me, he, went, he was wearing like four on each arm. Yeah, just like, oh, Max, he fucking just completely magnetized there. <laughs> you could not knock that guy out, I tell you. Yeah, we walk past um, a change jar, just take the whole thing with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, he, uh, he uh, bought them for $2 each. But it goes to show you how much... Oh, okay. Yeah, you bought them for two dollars each, and then was flogging them off for sixty bucks each. So, um, yeah, it's incredible. There's probably something there. Like, I'm sure, like we've got iron in ourselves, right? We've got we've got all these charges, and we so much electricity flowing through our body. I'm sure that there's something there that at some point someone's going to be able to come up with something for. But the bracelets, they weren't it. <laughs> but it just goes to show you, all you need is like a story to tell people, like, um, ah. Uh, what was it? I think Dr. Ben House, he posted it. It's just this book about like why we need stories, even when there's some, uh, scientific supporting evidence. Like I think humans just for thousands of years, our primary way of uh, knowledge transmission has just been stories. And it's only recently that we've had scientific papers. So I think even when we get presented with a scientific paper, the, the conscious brain in us likes us, but then the human in us is like, yeah, but tell me a cool story because that's what I really want to know. You know what I mean? So yeah, 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 man. The um, I think there's a lot to be said about um, uh, you know, just uh, hearsay or or whatever, where it's just like or talking about um, you know, your truth, and then it's like yeah. um, you know, so it's like when you when you tell these stories, people, it's very relatable, and that's it sort of carries over a little bit quicker, a little bit easier, and people are like, oh my god. 
really? You know, and then yeah. whereas you got a, a scientific study and it's like, well, that settles it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you know, that settles it, except this person said this, so that disproves the study all of a sudden. So it's like, well, you know, and who knows, man? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. You're exactly right. The stories are very important. Though. The, um, it does help. And then, yeah. and that's how you sell these things. And you know, they, that company ended up shutting down because they got uh, many, many lawsuits against them, as you can imagine. And um, right, okay, yeah, yeah, I was wondering. What, I wonder what that guy's doing now, though. Or was that just the guy that did Coney Twenty Twelve? Was that the same <laughs> dude? Like, yeah, maybe. You know, but apparently, what ended up happening there is they end up um, <clears throat> they filed for bankruptcy, connection. and then the company um, is now uh, called something else. Uh, I think it was called power band balance or something like that. Um, so virtually the same thing, just whatever. I just not nearly as popular as you can imagine, but I can't wait for the next one to come out, you know, what's the next one? Sorry. I just lost you there for a second. It, oh yeah. So I was just saying that. They, um, yeah. They opened up a new business under a different name. Um, and now I just I pivoted. Saying, oh, like, it'd be interesting to see what the next, next one's going to be, you know? Yeah. There's always something. Yeah, but I think we're a little bit too wise. We'd have to get old. We have to be old men, and then we're gonna bring out another one. No, but see, that's the thing. It's just the fresh people. There's always someone fresh in the industry. Well, like, I don't, I, I don't know if power bands will ever work again, but like something will. I just think we're gonna be those yeah. senile. No. We're gonna be those like cranky old men in like in rocking chairs and shit, just being like, man, don't fall for that shit. It's all, it's all crap. And then like, shut up, old man. And then we go ahead and do it anyways. <laughs> No, it's it's important learning experiences. You have to you have to meet these characters to you know sharpen your own sword when you become a trainer. You can't have someone pointed all out for you. So let's move on to the next one. So, uh, stable muscle stabilizer muscles don't exist. Yes, elaborate. Um, I think the big thing currently, I think where people are questioning stability is it's hard to objectively quantify. And now this doesn't mean that stability doesn't exist, but I think it's mischaracterized. Um, Cause like what, what's stability? Like I think Pat Davidson, he, he sort of talks about stability as something's likelihood of falling over. And then like my feeling of stability is just like, you know, someone's doing say a lunge and they're shaking all over the place. Like that doesn't really look stable to me. But again, that's more like my feelings towards the exercise. Not mm. like, okay, what, what is happening? What, what do I need so that it looks stable? So for me, stability looks like smooth, intentional, relatively consistent movement rep to rep. Uh, and so what creates that? Well, that's just inter and intramuscular coordination. So just the muscles firing in the right order at the right time at the right intensities and so what, where is the stabilizing effect? What are the stabilizer muscles? Because I think certain muscles get characterized as stabilizers, like the ones that more have an isometric role in exercises. Like, are they the stabilizer muscles? But then just, just call it was it what it is, right? Because that, that's the big issue as well. People, like, I want you to use this muscle to stabilize. It's like, how do I switch into stability mode? Like versus if you're like, Hey, this muscle, this one doesn't move in this exercise. Like when you squat, I don't want your trunk to rotate. So you keep this shit locked in. That's not stability. That's coordination. That's isometric contraction. That's we, we have things that are much more measurable there. So let's use those terms because I don't want to tell you to improve something that then I can't measure. Cause then what, how do I tell you if you've improved it or not? Like, how can we get meaningful information from that? So I think stability is, it's a, it's an interesting concept to explore, but then when, once it comes down to like communicating with an athlete or telling someone what you actually want them to do, I don't really see any muscles where I'd be like, that's a stabilizer muscle. Cause it, like, you know, even the muscles that we use to stabilize a lot in a gym context, like when we're lifting heavy in the athletic realm, often those muscles their, their function is much less uh, isometric. And yeah. it's actually, we need, need them to move and to contract and to lengthen under tension. Yeah, I like that idea because, you know, instead of trying to look after, look for one muscle for stabilizing a lunge, which is everyone usually goes to the glutes, yeah. um, you know, and it's like, well, 
Yes and no. And it's not that the muscle isn't, um, it's not stabilized. It's just like, I think what you said there was important is the fact that it's just the fact that your body has to get used to firing everything at the right time in order to yeah. maintain what we perceive as uh, stability. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really important. I think that's a good point. That's yeah. Good. And I think that just helps demystify stability for people because it sounds like this magic thing it's like oh the stability fairy will visit you in the middle of the night if you do certain exercises and things like that but it's like no you just you just need to get better at moving like if you just said that like if you go to someone and they do a bad lunge and you're like it's because you're unstable they're like what does that mean do I need to give this person money? Does that mean I get stability? Whereas if you just like, you just need to do the lunge more so that your body anticipates what you're trying to do and learns from previous experiences and you just get better at doing it. You just do it more. Like, and I think that's then all of a sudden people are like, oh, I know exactly what to do here. Like, yeah, thank yeah. you. And it usually comes down to their improvement will usually just come down to the fact that they're not aware of what you want them to do. And then when you make them aware of what you want from them, then they're able to deliver that. And if you tell someone as well, it comes down to like pain communication or good pain communication. Like you can really fuck someone up if you're like, Hey, your lower back's unstable versus if you say, Hey, you need to learn how to control, like how to move your lower back with a bit more intent. Mm. Uh, I think that is something that's a bit more empowering. You're like, oh, I can do that. I can, I can think about how I move my lower back and try to make the movement there less unintentional. Um, then I, I just think it's, it's just a bit yeah. better for everyone. So you People are so that, easy um, to scare. Well, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Are you, are you saying that by saying that your back is unstable because that's got such negative connotations to it that they are yeah. going to be walking around life thinking that you know, they're going to do that back at any moment? Some people will like, cause I, I hate this whole thing. Cause th- I think this is one of the good things to emerge from really politically correct culture. Um, because fitness is just a microcosm of the bigger world at the end of the day. And I think everyone is sort, is sort of thinking about the language that they use. And like, it's the same as like, you can say something to someone and this is not to do with fitness. You could use a certain word that we don't use anymore or just certain things that aren't deemed as politically correct. And some people, they won't care. They'll just be like, oh, water off a duck's back. But then some people, you say something, even in a way about someone that's not them, but they're, and they'll get offended by that. It's the same with communication when it comes to symptoms and things like that in fitness. You get some big mentally robust guy, you're like, hey, your lower back's unstable. He's like, cool, man, what have I got to do to fix it? Not really affected, don't care. But then you tell someone like my mum that she has an unstable lower back and like that is just imprinted onto the front of her brain for the rest of her fucking life. And it's just like, can you please watch it around those people? Like, it's so case by case. So if you just are on the side of caution, when you're meeting someone for the first time, don't tell them they're unstable. In my opinion, I think it's a good way to mess up some people. Yeah, I think that's sound advice. So um, let's move on to the next one. Good program excuse me good programming doesn't work if your clients move if your clients move like shit yes i think that's a that's a muscle dot quote you can't uh, i think that's almost you can't, you can't qualify it until you can qualify it and mm. it's just so true like the whole idea of a program is to like manage load right but what are you managing if it's inconsistent like you just you can't, you can't track anything there. And I think the studies have come out saying, you know, even humans, when it looks like consistent movement, we're probably not as consistent as what we think, but I think, you know, there's a close enough sort of thing that applies here. The yep. more consistently you move, then the more closely we can quantify things. But then even then, like now some days, cause I realize how variable, you know, especially in athletic context, movement can be, I find myself programming more, exercises that we call repetition without repetition so someone just getting someone to do like you know a minute's worth of lunge variations but just keep them moving their feet into different positions those are the sorts of exercises that i actually prescribe now so that's even muddied the waters further of like what is a program like what does it even mean like this thing that i think people take probably an overly scientific approach to um but i i, I just think I think people lie to themselves a lot with like how closely they can control things with a program. I, I find myself just going for a much less structured approach these days. Because mm. um, mm. I think, yeah, I think people create too much structure thinking that there's going to be this really predictable and scientific 
uh, outcome, but the human body and the way we live our lives, it's so chaotic and there's so many open systems that are interacting with each other that like, you know, if you're doing strength training, you can predict the outcome of strength. But then it's like, if I do X amount of strength training, I don't know that you're going to get Y amount stronger. I just know strength training makes you strong. We have no idea about like predicting outcomes and things like that. So it just seems like kind of inappropriate to have like a really precise program. I kind of run off minimum viable program as a bit of a concept these days. Mm. Sort of, you know. You know, when I when I read um when I read that post of yours, what came to mind initially was if so good programming doesn't work if your clients move like shit. So I was like, well, yeah, I understand like what came to my mind initially was like, okay, yeah. So my clients have really bad um, you know, uh mobility in the squat then because they can't squat um i might try to get them stronger when they squat but because they're not moving efficiently when they squat it's not going to really uh they're not really going to get as strong as possible because they're not moving in a in a in a good manner but what you're saying uh was a little bit different whereas it's like okay well no but that's true too what you said oh yeah 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 true. i just yeah. thought it was interesting the the mindset you had was actually a little bit more the opposite whereas it's like okay uh, i'm more thinking about structured manner whereas you're like okay um you know it's you're going more into like um less structured programming and uh which was kind of interesting a little bit different i thought yeah yeah well because it's i think it comes down to like looking what the stimulus is and i think that can change for different people like because mm-hmm. unless you're a power lifter the stimulus isn't the bench press. It's just what muscles you're using at what velocity, at what joint angles, at what proximity to failure. So it's like, how, how do you, how, how do you represent that in a program? And that's where like, I've been doing a bit more, I wouldn't call it a full blown West side style, but like a little bit West side influence where it's just like, yeah, it's max effort upper body come in, try hard. We're using the upper body and that's sort of our, our the structure that we've provided and that that's our stimulus for the day but then however you want that to look can be up to you if that's with a barbell in your hands or if that's you know just to get it done get get the you know get the, what is the stimulus remove all the program until all you're looking at is just like you've just written out your stimuli yeah yeah that, that's sort of more of the approach i've been i've been taking these days yeah, I think that's good because it's quite forgiving in a way uh, because you may have something programmed in, but that client just can't come in and do it that day for whatever reason because yeah. you know, they might be injured. Uh, they just might be unusually stiff. And- I mean, yes, exactly. Yeah, and then having a robust plan that can adapt to their needs rather than making them adapt to the program because you want to have you know, the human being and then the program just adapts to them and facilitates them all the time, not, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of this stuff has been inspired. Have you heard of Mladen Jovanovic? Yeah. He wrote a good, uh, his whole model is like agile periodization. I'm sort of like two thirds of the way through his book. Uh, I think it's volumes one and two. I think I'm just dipping into volume two now, but it's like, yeah, it's, there's some really interesting stuff in there. Yeah. Well, there you go. The, um, so let's move on to the next one. WTF. What the fuck does activation mean? Yeah. This is another one, sort of like the stabilizer thing. It's like, well, muscles don't stabilize. Like, I don't know what that is. And then like, what is it, what does a muscle do when it activates? Like, uh, like, so I think the idea is that people, when you say you want to activate a muscle, it's because they feel like they can't get the muscle contracting, but then all activation protocols seem to be just contracting the muscle. But I'm like, I thought we couldn't do that. That's why we needed to activate. But then you're like, no, just do it. And it's like, well, if I could activate it, I would just activate it. I wouldn't have to do the activation. So it's just this weird thing. It doesn't make sense. I'm like, I can't do this. And I'm like, do it. It's definitely Versus, a buzzword, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you're exactly right. Because, I mean, if you can't activate it, you can activate it. Yeah. So it's like glutes extend and externally rotate and abduct the femur. So then all glute activation is extending the hip, externally rotating and abducting the femur, which is, I, it's, it's fucking bananas. Like there's so many things in fitness that people just say, and they're like, that sounds good. I'll just say that. And then, you know, as soon as, soon as someone checks, it's like, wait, hold on. What are we actually trying to do here? It all just falls apart. Yeah, um, I mean, Cause I think a lot of it is people are just, 
they don't have their body in a position that creates leverage for certain muscles. And people mm. just buy certain positions over and over again where they're leveraging certain muscles and they're not leveraging other muscles as well. And then th- that second group turns into the muscles that then people think need activating when it's really, you just need to put your skeleton into a different shape. And then you, all of a sudden you'll find that you have easier access, I guess, for lack of a better word to these muscles, because like in my mind, you need to put length into a muscle to increase its ability to contract. Like you to think about like a runner when someone's running along the ground, how do you get hip extension? You hit the ground with a flexed hip, your butt, has an elastic response to that that obviously starts down at the foot. So foot pronates and stretches out when it hits the ground at the same thing. That's that's kick starts a chain of events all the way up your leg, all the way up into your noggin, really like that's how you get a glute to activate in the real world. Um, or at least in the athletic context. And I just see like a lot of activation protocols. None of them really go to like, you know, putting length into a muscle to increase its contractile potential. Right, because it's. I think we have this gym centric view of muscle activation. We get a weight, and then we squeeze a muscle. And we try to shorten it. Whereas when you don't have weights, that's how you load tissue. You stretch it out by creating a collision, like with the ground, and then mm. then the the muscle stretches out, and then it springs us off. Yeah, like that's activation in my, in my eyes. Or I would yeah, call I, that I, activation. I guess these um activation exercises just appear to me to be just easier exercises that are, you know, um, exercises that are, make it easier for you to, act, to, to use the muscles that you are struggling yeah. to use in the exercise, but that doesn't necessarily translate over to the exercise because, you know, you still don't know how to use the muscle in that movement. So yeah. maybe the best thing to do would be to be like, just do the movement, but just spend more time trying to use the muscle in the movement yeah. or, or trying to use that type of movement pattern in the movement because you might be squatting and your knees might be coming in. And if your coach doesn't like that, you know, instead of getting you to do side band walks or something like that, maybe it's just best to spend a little bit more time squatting with your knees yeah. over your toes or whatever. And that's the thing as well, right? Like I can see how if you don't feel your butt muscles, you want to feel those glutes. So you can try to tune into that and you can try to, you just want to feel the glute in isolation so that when you're doing a more complex movement, you can seek out that sensation. Be like, where's that feeling that I felt when I was using my glutes? Can I feel that when I'm trying to use all these muscles together? That can be helpful. But just the way people do that, with this, people have trouble feeling their glutes, so they use the bands, which have a really terrible strength curve. They go from like barely any resistance to a hell of a lot of resistance within a really short space. And I think if you have trouble using a muscle and contracting it, that's probably not a good environment to set that up. Um, So even that, even once you're operating within that space of like, okay, I'm going to pretend it's a thing for a second. It's still just the implementation is a little bit awkward because if you want to feel a glute contraction, I would say just like doing an isometric glute bridge where you just hold it at the top or even like a single leg version, and you're just trying to hold that hip in hip extension. I think things like that could be kind of good for like feeling the muscle contract if yeah. that's something you feel like you need to show someone. But that doesn't mean in every workout. It's like once you've done it a couple of times, it's like you, you, they should be able to reference that and just get straight back into it without doing a whole bloody activation routine if you've done a good job of coaching them how to move. Mm. So um, we're almost out of time. And uh, so I want to ask you this last question. Uh, so this is the last post that, um, you know, I plucked out of your gram. And it was that <clears throat> taking a deeper breath doesn't mean you're going to have greater intra-abdominal, intra-abdominal pressure. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> so, and, and that comes down to that thing of like, one, why are you trying to get more air in there in the first place? Do we just need more efficient breathing mechanics? I think people are always worried about, you know, getting a deeper breath, but all you're doing is creating more work for yourself. Like at the end of the day, certain muscles have to work really hard to drag all that air into you and anything that you're doing is a stress. So you're really just increasing stress when you're always trying to take deep breaths all the time rather than focusing on efficient breathing. And then even in a heavy lifting context, it's like the, the only reason you need air in there is to create pressure. You do not need a big space or a lot of volume to create pressure. You just need a lot of air relative to the space. Mm. So by closing 
because when you inhale and when you exhale, we make certain shapes, right? So if you really exaggerate an exhale, obviously that's going to be shrinking the space that you have to contain air. So when you breathe out hard, what do you feel? So you probably feel your ribs cage close off. You probably lean forward and flex your thoracic spine a little bit. So that's the shape that's easiest to create pressure in because it's a smaller space. So if you can drag as much air as possible in, into that tiny exhaled shape, because obviously you can inhale and if you try to inhale as much volume as air as possible, you'll notice you go back the other way. So you want to inhale, but without creating an inhaled shape, if that makes yeah. sense. You don't want to go into that, uh, you know, flexion or extension. Extension, of the spine. yeah. Yeah, you want to be more in uh, neutral or slight, or would you even say slightly? I think so. so. This is where, like, dude, some people are really extended when they squat, mm. and they do just take a bigger breath of air, and it seems to go fine with them. I just don't know if it's the way to go for everyone. Like, for me, that position never felt comfortable for me. Uh, my back doesn't like being in that extended posture all the time. But then you get some powerlifters, and they they say they do it, and their back feels fine. Mm. So, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that where you don't want to be, but you don't want that to be your only strategy that you use for every single exercise. If that's your low bar squat strategy, then that's fine. But you know, when you're doing a different version of the squat, I don't think you always want to be sort of going into that super, super, uh, expanded posture. Um, but it's, it's just a tool like anything else. I think most people should just be focused on, you know, creating that small space and regardless even if it can be used effectively i still think it's a challenge just taking in all that air i also have a completely unscientifically backed hypothesis that this is also perhaps what makes people vulnerable to hernias and things like that like stretching out that abdominal wall under load and obviously we're adaptable human beings i'm not trying to scare anyone um mm. but i can see that 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 would definitely place more stress on that abdominal wall like I don't know if it's you know, I don't know if it's a great talking, idea. I think you're right. I was talking to um, uh, Doctor um, <clears throat> Andrew Locke. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Guy. yeah, yeah. So he was on. Me and him have some conflicting views, but generally speaking, I think he has good ideas on stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. And um, you know, he's he's pretty much he, he's a bit of an on uh, like a non nonsense kind of guy. He's pretty cut and dry, you know. Like yeah, um, he um, yes. Yeah. He, he said Calls that, um, spade spade. yeah, he does, you know, and, and, you know, he's not afraid to call it out. And this one thing, um, that this Australian, uh, scientist, she came up, I think it was a, she, she came up with this idea that, uh, the best way to activate your core is by pulling in your belly button or trying to get your TBA to kind of activate, trying to like, yeah. And, um, you know, he's like, you know, around that time, um, you know, we started seeing more hernias. And, yeah. um, and then, you know, so it's like, um, you know, so are we trying to be pulling our stomach in or are we trying to be pushing our stomach out? You know, see, I think they're both off. <laughs> yeah. Well, there I, we go. Let's hear it. Here's why everyone's wrong and I'm right. <laughs> By Angus Bradley. <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> life story. I don't want you to hold anything. Be in the position and then the right muscles will activate which I know it's almost like saying the same thing, but people, the reason why people feel like they need to hold their guts in is because of the shape their skeleton is in. Every time you inhale, your diaphragm is pushing your guts down, but your pelvis isn't in a good position to receive the guts because you, your pelvis, your pelvic bowl, the space down there that your diaphragm swooshes your guts into. So if you always feel like you need to hold yourself in, that's because you're opened up like this. You have ribs flared, you're in an anterior tilt, you have an extended lumbar spine, extended beyond neutral, I would say. Whereas if you get your ribs in and if you tilt your belt buckle back up towards your nose so that your diaphragm and your pelvic floor are actually stacked over each other, mm. when you inhale, you are naturally going to have that, for lack of a better word, let's use their term, activation. Mm. Put yourself in the position and you, do, you, do, you won't need to pull in. You won't need to expand out. You just inhale and mwah, everything will just probably go really, really well. You might, you might actually struggle to get a lot of air in because most people won't be able to expand their ribcage laterally or anterior to posteriorly 
uh, at least initially, but if you continue to breathe this way and you continue to practice this stacked position and rest uh, breathing, taking full breathing cycles in this stacked position, you don't need to do push in, push out. It's just, you will create intra-abdominal pressure really, really well. Because if you think about that piston in a cylinder mm. and just that reciprocal <clears throat> movement between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor versus if you open it up into that open scissor position and then that diaphragm descends, it's just going to push all your guts out the front. Like, so yeah. that's why I think everyone thinks that they need to hold everything in just because they don't necessarily know how to manage that, that canister. Yeah. Is your I agree with you there hundred percent. I mean, like I remember like, Cause, sorry, so, sorry to cut you off. Cause look at Andrew Locke and the way he walks around and like, it's like, yeah, your, yeah, your guts are all out your front, man. Like, yeah, the guy looks like it. Tell you, sin powerlifting strategy, but yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I really like Andrew Locke, and it, but he, yeah, he oh, does cool like guy. that uh, that gorilla posture, you know that. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and it's good. It's good for some things. It's mm. like, it's good for bench pressing, I think. Like, mm. When you look at most benches, they kind of look like that. Yeah, yeah. I um I sort of relate this back to my um my squatting, and I'm not a. Uh, I'm okay squatter, but I, I've got um, this this kind of issue with the fact that my front squat uh, got up to uh, 170 <laughs> kilos, right? I remember this saga. 170 kilo front squat and a uh, 180 kilo back squat. Isn't that terrible? You know, it isn't. It isn't. It's it's kind of bad. It's just like I think what that really showed for me is like because I had um one of my other guys in there, Sam, and he um. Uh, he was my training partner for a while and he, he could front squat about 170 as well, but his back squat was about 200. And I'm like, maybe that's what I should be doing. And then I started to realize yeah. that um, the front squat, my front squat position uh, was a better core position because, you know, um, I was yes. just, I think my, my core was in a better and easier position. to make. Because you had your weight out in front, your scaps would have been forward so you could ex- posteriorly expand your rib cage mm. so that you'd be able to, better pressurize the canister it all just seemed to be good and then my back spot was quite the opposite whereas i think i i had trouble maintaining my my position of my my pelvis and my chest and because of that i would lose the stability because when your shoulders go back your sternum has to go forward so it's naturally gonna push you into a bit more of that open scissor position yeah and then this is where i come back to i know we're running out of time but like Mm. is bracing the most important thing when it comes to lifting success, I don't think so because I don't. I, I see a lot of people with terrible bracing strategies that lift a lot of weight. So mm. I think it's just. I just. I, I can. I just, just kind of. Um, I'm at this point right now where I blame my, uh, my my bracing strategy on the deficit between my squat and front squat because I, I, my back squat should be ahead of of where it is, but it's not. Yeah. And I think it is because I'm not bracing as well as I should, but I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. It could have a, it could, it could be other factors. I'm just, you know, just wrap your knees tighter. <laughs> uh, I think we'll call it there. Um, in my pathetic sort of squatting. And um, could you just let everyone know moment. where they can go out to find you, dude? Yes. So, uh, especially look, if you're from the gong and you're looking for a surfing program to improve surfing performance or just general performance around the ocean, I've just released surfing fundamentals and there is a surfing fundamentals, Instagram and Facebook page for all general coaching inquiries. Just when it comes to general training or lifting weights, you can find me at Angus Bradley 92 on Instagram. And then I am also wearing, as you can see the high performance podcast shirt where we usually have episodes coming out every Monday, right? Owner has definitely messed with our schedule and my co-host is becoming our father this week, but we'll be back to regular episodes, hopefully from next week. How good is this? Um, (laughs) (laughs) That was a great reference. Yeah. um, Yeah. So definitely check out the podcast. It is top notch. Um, And um, so thanks for coming on, man. I really do. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really fun chat. So if you guys are on on um youtube please give us a, a thumbs up give us a follow if you are on um on itunes please leave us a five-star review um leave us a nice comment and i'll see you guys next week